The Quiet Warrior Show, where we help top leaders find their pathway to incredible success and a lifetime of happiness. Here is your host, Tom Dutta, The Quiet Warrior. Well, welcome to The Quiet Warrior Show. My name is Tom Dutta, and I am The Quiet Warrior, and I'm excited today to have on my show Mr. Michael Levin. Michael, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks, Tom. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. No, I've been excited about this one. You know, you and I have met in the past through business, and yeah, I think you're down there in Brookline, Mass. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes, sir. Here I am, Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. The power of the internet. <laughs> so, Michael, yep. I think I think a good way to start today is just to well, I'll turn it to you. Tell us tell us about yourself and what you do. <sighs> Wow. I'm a writer guy. I write books. I have a ghostwriting company called Business Ghost, uh, businessghost.com. And we've been around for almost 24 years. We've done almost, we've done over 550 books. Wow. Um, we've had eight, 18 national bestsellers, two New York Times bestsellers, one Kindle number one business book bestseller, um, on and on. Uh, I'm a Columbia Law School graduate. I practiced law for about an hour. I didn't like it. It didn't like me. <laughs> so, you know, we, we had a mutual parting of the ways and uh, that was fine. And now I run a company. We've, uh, we've, there are 50 of us at Business Go, 22 writers and, and, uh, and uh, 28 uh, in management or editorial or uh, uh, publishing. And we're kind of boutique-y. We do about 100 books a year. We're never going to get so big that, uh, that uh, it's a mass sort of thing. And, uh, I'm very grateful that the whole thing has worked out. So that's, uh, that's it. I'm married. I have four kids, 17 down to nine. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, you know, I could go on, but that's a lot of talking about me. So I'll stop. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, it's fascinating. I, I, I knew a little bit about you. Well, actually I knew a lot about your background, but, uh, you're very humble. Congratulations on all the success. I mean, you have some passions too. I, I, I saw somewhere that I think at one point you were on Shark Tank. <laughs> yeah, I, I was. And I was interviewing the executive producer of Shark Tank for a client's book. And 40 minutes into the interview, he said, let me turn this around. Have you ever thought about applying for our show? And I, I about fell off my chair. And I said, no, I mean, I don't think my business is sexy enough. It's me in a room typing. Yeah. He said, I disagree. I think it's very sexy and I want you to apply. So if the executive producer <laughs> wants you, <laughs> it's, you know, it's going to work out. So I, I didn't have to, you know, stand in a warehouse with 40,000 other entrepreneurs on a freezing day in Dallas or something like that. They just <laughs> sort of ushered me to the front of the line and I, I taped and they, they, it, they, it's interesting. They tape 110 entrepreneurs over Labor Day weekend, wow. back to back to back. The, uh, the the sharks know nothing about who you are or what you do. They have no background. And of the 110, they only use the 35 that they consider the best television. So I just consider the whole thing sort of a gift from God that it worked out because uh, it re-airs every eight to 10 weeks and the phone jumps and people call and they say, hey, I saw you on Shark Tank and <laughs> I want you guys to work. So, well, that's an amazing story. Deal. I, didn't know, I didn't know that's how they did it. I mean, that's like the marathon of Shark Tank. Um, what a great story. Yeah. You know, I, 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 yeah. also, I also know that, you know, one of the things I appreciate about you, Michael, is I've learned to read your blog. <laughs> There's so many blogs out there. And uh, you write some pretty compelling things. You've also written for uh, 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 other media. And I think, you know, a big part of my show, The Way of the, or the Quiet Warrior Show, and I've written a book called The Way of the Quiet Warrior, and that's how you and I met. Because you, you helped me unleash what was in me, there was all sorts of fear to doing it. And I just look at, you know, what you're doing. It's a gift to, to people in the world who have a story to tell. And the bigger purpose is you're, 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 a th you're really a thought leader on steroids because you're, you're finding a tribe of others and helping them do the same. So fun to have you on my show today. Uh, I just want to say that I'd like to think I'm a thought leader, but I'm definitely not on steroids. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have to fix that. <laughs> uh, and, oh yeah, well, you run marathons, so 
Yeah, I'm glad you're not on steroids. You wouldn't be allowed in. <laughs> no, I, I just did. I did the uh, New York City Marathon this past Sunday. I run in New York as a guide runner for disabled runners, and it took us eight hours and three minutes. But we got our uh, our, our runner to the finish line. She had a uh, she was in a car accident when she was a kid, and she went through the windshield because she didn't have her seatbelt on. So wow. don't have your nine year old in the front seat without her seatbelt on, folks. And uh, hmm. uh, so she did suffer some brain damage, but she can go 26 miles. And there are 2 million spectators in New York. There are 51,000 runners and there are only about 100, 150 people in yellow t-shirts guiding disabled runners. So hmm. I'm, um, I'm still kind of blown away by the fact that I got to do it. My knees hurt a little bit, but yeah. you know, I'm 59 I'm still out there. So. Well, that's um, great. Congrats. And when it, that's, we could do a whole episode on that, that inspirational story you just told. And it just reminds me too, that you're in a part of you know, the, the nation where there's been some unfortunate events of late. We see it on local uh, cable and, you know, to, to still, you know, move forward and put on those kind of events, I think is heroic. So on that, it's a good segue. I'm like, I want to get into your hero's journey story. You know, those who listen to my show know that we, we bring people on who don't have egos, but they're authentic and they talk about their success in business and life. And, you know, we learn from these stories, but the real untold story is what's behind that success. And, and the hero's journey is really when sometimes not so good things happen in our life. Sometimes it, it's right back to familial times or family origins. And there are many people who have lives where they get stuck. Uh, you've you've had a life where you've taken uh, past events and, and ups and downs along the way and turned it into this incredible story of success. So, you know what, I'm going to just let you talk at us and tell us about your story. Take us back. Uh, sure. This, these are things I typically don't get into <laughs> in an interview or in a podcast, but since you've asked, um, my mother's father was murdered in a mob hit when I was 10, wow. and our family collapsed around the need to care for my grandmother, uh, who died four and a half years later of uh, breast cancer, but really of a broken heart. Hmm. And uh, this took down my parents' marriage. Um, my sisters and I all turned to um, adult substances, even though we weren't adults. Uh, the three of us are now all in recovery. Uh, uh, in my 20s, I, went, I did go to graduated Columbia Law School and published three novels for Simon & Schuster and another book, but at the same time, I uh, couldn't keep a dollar in my pocket, couldn't stay in a relationship for more than an hour, I uh, couldn't uh, have terrible family relationships. Everything was, uh, I, was I, I like to say, I overcame every advantage on my way to the bottom. Mm. And when I was uh, 32 or so, I got in 32, 33, a little younger than I guess, but I, around, right around that age, I got into recovery and uh, stopped drinking and uh, um, you know, went into therapy and um, uh, did what I needed to do brick by brick to rebuild myself or to be rebuilt, I should say, uh, by, you know, by, by God and, and uh, others as a working, successful copy of a human being or an original of a human being. And, um, you know, I started the business uh, um, as part of that process. I was, uh, I, I, as I said, I'd sold three novels to Simon Schuster and I'd written the fourth. Actually, had written a fourth and a fifth, and we just couldn't come to terms, and they just weren't happy, and I wasn't happy with, you know, they're not being happy, and you know, it was it was just uh, tough, and I ran out of money. Um, I went into a uh, um, uh, sort of a group that works with people who are, uh, you know, strapped financially. I met a man who became my mentor, and he's still my mentor, uh, almost 24 years. Later, we met January thirty first, nineteen ninety four. So it'll be twenty three years, wow. a few months. And he sat me down in a Dunkin' Donuts uh, here in Brookline, and he said, "Michael, I've worked with a lot of creative people, and you guys can." He was a top businessman who had also mm -hmm. lost everything due to his own uh, alcoholism, and mm -hmm. uh, he said, "I've worked with you, a lot of you creative people. You cannot do your best work if you can't put bread on the table or pay your bills." and uh, he took out a single sheet of paper. He showed me on a single sheet of paper how to start a business, which was originally offering writing classes. Mm -hmm. uh, since I've been teaching writing a little bit at UCLA, and uh, and I did what he said. I built the classes and built more classes. I started in the yoga studio and then moved to a church. 
Yep. And, uh, uh, and the thing took off and people before long were saying, uh, and it, you know, coach me and, uh, consult with me. And then they were, and then they said, Hey, you just write it for me. Then one day, about a dozen years ago, I looked at the numbers and I realized, uh, I was making a lot more money ghostwriting than I was teaching writing or mm-hmm. coaching. So, uh, I changed the name of the company from writer to author, which is what it was then to business ghost. And here we are now, you know, it's 20, almost 24. Is that right? No, it's almost 24 years since that, uh, meeting in the Dunkin' Donuts. And as I said, 550 books, uh, all that stuff has happened. Uh, along the way I met my wife and got married and, uh, we have uh, four kids and they've never seen me drink. Um, and uh, they get up and see me go to work. And you know, my, my sons are 15 and they, they go to a religious uh, seminary high school and they're there 12 hours a day from morning services to evening services with classes and everything else interspersed. Sometimes I go over there and join them for the evening services. When I, I'll do that tonight when I pick them up. And, uh, and then they go to the gym because they, they know that their dad's a marathoner, a triathlete, and he gets after it. And uh, I never said to them, go to the gym. I never said to them, take religion seriously. Um, but, uh, you know, the, uh, the old nightingale says, what you do speaks so loudly, I can hardly hear a word you're saying. <laughs> so, you know, my, my girls are terrific and very blessed. Well, you are. You are. Uh, my, go- my gosh, I, you know, your story is, is incredible. And, as you were talking, Michael, there's so many whys that were coming into my mind. So I'm going to just ask you a couple of things. Uh, g- going back, you know, sometimes I'll talk about what I call the leadership graveyard. And, you know, I've spent 30 years in, in corporate America working with many leaders and being one myself. And along the way, we fall down into this graveyard of life and business. And, and, I, and uh, you know, you, you said that 33 years you stopped, you had stopped drinking and my big question is, what? take us back, but what triggered you to stop? Why did you sort of say, this is enough? Sure. Um, my sisters had gotten sober, and I was seeing the progression of their lives. And then I was seeing the, some other relatives of mine who were continuing to drink, and I saw which way their lives were going. And it was really just sort of standing at the crossroads and saying, who would I rather be like? My, like my younger sisters or these other folks? And, uh, you know, it was a pretty easy choice. Um, and it took me a while. It took me a few years to uh, recognize, come to terms with my own alcoholism. I didn't want to be an alcoholic. But, uh, you know, I found that <clears throat> if you, uh, one of the day you start calling yourself an alcoholic is the day the rest of the world stops calling you one. So. Um, yeah, uh, all in all, it was, uh, it's fine. You know, this is a big part of my life. My recovery is a big part of my life. I, uh, proud of it. I'm grateful for it. I'm grateful. I'm 59 now. I'm grateful to the kid who was 32, 33 and, uh, said, Hey, you know, I better do something here. And I'm grateful that I never quit. Um, you know, I'm grateful yeah, that I've, uh, yeah. stayed with the, uh, with the drill. Well, good on you. I mean, I'm proud of you. The other thing that I'm I'm interested in is I think your dad is is your is your father a lawyer? You don't have to get into his yeah. background, but okay. Yeah. My, so you, you yeah, have, my dad. You, say again. Go on. Oh, my father, my grandfather was a lawyer. My dad just retired. He's in his early eighties. Oh, okay. My my grandfather was an attorney. My great aunt. Uh wow. she graduated <laughs> NYU law school in the twenties. The family legend is that she was uh on her way to Italy to uh, finish her singing lessons and, and become a, uh, of a, uh, an opera singer. And she uh, uh, was pregnant, she found out. So she turned around and went to law school instead, which is a pretty wild thing for a woman to do in the late 20s, early 30s. And uh, so I, I knew her uh, in the 70s, in the 1970s, when she, you know, before she passed away. And, and uh, she was a she was the president of the New York Bar Association, all kinds. Of, so there, there are tons of lawyers in, in my family. Uh, no, that's cool. Ahead. Yeah, that's that's awesome. And and so that there's lessons in leadership in this story, from for many who are, you know they go and they work for somebody else or they start off on a path and 
sometimes I'll say, you know, we're on the unthinking treadmill of life. We end up in a certain pathway, but the reality is a lot of people stay on that pathway and they, they don't course correct. Tell us, tell us why you, you know, obviously you change course to start your own business. What's that all about? How'd you do that? Well, when you're unemployable, <laughs> becoming a business <laughs> seems like a business. You know, I mean, I'd like to say it's the option I chose, but it was the only. I mean, you know, if you have no options, then you know, you don't have them. Then it's not really. Let's tell the truth. I became a business owner because uh, I'm fundamentally unemployable. You know, I'm um, uh, I'm a, I'm I'm a rebel by nature, and it's sort of like the Marlon Brando. <laughs> lying in the wild I said to him what are you against and he said what do you got <laughs> so you know i i, I went into a uh, a training program uh for entrepreneurs and the very first thing they said is that uh you are an entrepreneur you're not a, you're not a writer and you don't have a furniture store and you're not a financial advisor you guys are all entrepreneurs with a specialty in whatever the thing is that you are doing or selling and uh, entrepreneurs are a different kind of cat. And I never knew that about myself. It was uh, revelatory. Yeah. to discovered that, you know, that that's my nature. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in many ways, I'm not cut out to be a business owner because I'm a high anxiety person. I take everything personally. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll say to my assistant, here's what I want you to say, but take the emotion out. <laughs> so, I, you, know, you know, I've disabled the send button. But, the, but uh, you know, and, and I was telling my daughter earlier today about this. I said, you know, I said, look, you know me. I cry at commercials. Uh, you know, I've said separation <laughs> anxiety. I'm at the airport. I see strangers kissing goodbye. I said, don't go. You know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know. I love it. And, you know, so I, you're, you're, you're just an entrepreneur and, you know, the world's run by entrepreneurs and, you know, there are people who drop out of school. I think the, the list is long of, you know, people who have built companies. Uh, even Einstein, I think, you know, was one who didn't finish school. But there's so many people who who take that entrepreneurial track, and you know, they go. They also learn that you know they they can't, they don't have what it takes to keep moving forward, especially when the tough times come. I think you talked about running out of money and things like that. So you have a mentor. Just if you can't tell us what what advice you might have for others in terms of having a mentor, why is that important? <laughs> Well, as the expression goes, it's always darkest before it turns totally black. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. <ya. laughs> so, so, um, I mean, you know, we need, uh, I love my dad, uh, but he was not uh, really capable of being, you know, the sort of mentor figure that you might want a father to be. And what it really means is that I had to go out and, 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 and get reparented. Mm-hmm. And uh, find men who could uh, give me the puzzle pieces that I might not have gotten growing up. Um, and uh, um, to have somebody you can go to with your day-to-day stuff is incredibly important. And then also, you know, when the relationship lasts a long time, there's a track record. As I said, it's almost 24 years since Bob and I first met. Wow. and um, you, know, uh, you know, you know, this is what always, you always have this, you, you know, you always have this, uh, fear and then a week later this happened and you don't even remember you called me and you're upset. So the fact that there's somebody else, um, you know, I've worked with a, on a book with a therapist in Los Angeles. It was Dr. Renee Hollander. He made a great point. He said, "He said uh, life is or self-image is all about I, uh, me seeing you, seeing me, seeing you, seeing me." You need to, you need to be able to um, sort of measure yourself off of the way other people view you. I mean, that's just that's just human nature. So if you if you aren't getting the right kind of uh, viewing from the other person, so you can. Sort of calibrate properly how to view yourself. You better find somebody who who does value you, and who does appreciate you, and who 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 does show you the uh, caring, the affection that you need. Men men need that. Men, I can't speak to you know. I, I mean, I I I, I, I'm, I I can't speak to 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 women's needs in general, but 
it certainly speaks to men, but I don't think it's that different for women. We need, we all need to be appreciated. We all need to feel understood. We all need to feel that there's somebody we can go to. And, um, you know, it, it's not just having a mentor. It's also having a deep bench mm-hmm. because there's, some, you know, I'm, I'm going through something in my business right now that uh, triggers some very difficult memories uh, for my mentor. Mm-hmm. So I've, I've just come to realize that it's not fair for me to bring him that stuff. The good news is that there are other people I can go to. And because um, I recognized early on in life that you have to think globally with friendship because people are so mobile today. You know, guys in New York, then he moves to Arizona. You know, you see, you know yeah, I moved from California to Boston. So you have to think, you have to think globally and, and, and long term and longitudinally about friendship. It's not just simply who's the guy down the block. You're yeah. borrowing. So I've got a very, very deep bench, and I've got people I can call on just about any issue, uh, any time, and get the guidance I need. So, you know, uh, there's a certain amount of, uh, um, you know, they talk about PTSD and the soldiers. Well, the soldiers are 18, 19, which is amazing. A little PTSD or uh, a sense of. A sense of Michael, can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay, that's better. Can you hear me? Yeah, it was breaking up for a bit there. We'll probably edit some of that. Oh. Yeah. Okay, more, sure. So yeah. I'll I'll start that I'll start that piece over. Yeah. Um yeah. And, and more briefly. So, um you know, I've got a deep bench and uh there are some things that my sponsor, damn it, I'm not supposed to use that word because that, that, that talks about AA. Let me let me uh, try that again. Sure. As long as we've stopped. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very fortunate not just to have a mentor figure, but also a deep bench in the sense that I've got a bunch of men, a bunch of friends, men and women I can turn to when I have an issue and that, that needs to be worked out. Right now, I'm going through something in my business that brings up a lot of unhappy memories for my mentor. So I realize it's not fair to bring that stuff to him. He's not a paid therapist. He's, uh, he's a friend. He's a mentor. So Instead, I have other people I, I can take these issues to for whom it is not emotional and about which uh, they have experience and, and, and they can guide me and give me the sort of the practical and spiritual guidance I need. So, you know, I'm looking at it this way. Um, Tiger Woods has a swing coach, mm-hmm. okay? What does he do? He plays golf. Golf's okay, but, you know, life's even more important than golf. Yeah. And so why is it that people think that they can figure life out on their own or they don't need any coaching? I don't understand, you know, uh, I don't understand why, why we all have to be John Wayne when, when John Bradshaw and John Gray are available to guide us. But that's just my own two cents. No, I, I, I think it's great. For, for, uh, Michael, the, the advice you've just given is, is so, help, so helpful. And, you know, my personal feeling is that I think one of the reasons why you're, you so get the need to have a mentor through your life is because you're one of those people who has a high threshold of, uh, to, be, to show vulnerability. I, I work with a lot of CEOs in the coaching work I do, and uh, I'm not stereotyping here, but there's a lot of egos and they're not checked at the door. And, you know, sometimes having an accountability coach means you have to be accountable <laughs> and somebody has to hold you accountable. <laughs> no, not everybody wants to do that. So, I honor I honor what you you're doing because it's just it, it just awesome. Um, as we move to wrap up, I wanted to uh, just ask you one more question, and, and it is about if I met you on the street and I didn't know you, and I said, you know, Michael Levin, what what's your purpose? What's your meaning and purpose in the world? What would you say? Oh, I'd say it's love and service. You know, that's really what life yeah. is about. Um, awesome. You know, we uh, it's it's. Uh, you know, and, 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 and that's it. I mean, it, it, we feel good when, I mean, look, I, I ran the marathon as a, uh, as a guide runner for disabled runners. My sixth time doing that in the last eight years in New York and my yeah. seventh time overall, 16 marathons. The, uh, I, I mentioned it because, you know, everybody knows that there's a runner's high or, you know, an, an athlete's high when you're working out or you're running and your body's chemical set produces the norepinephrine high that feels so good. Well, there's also a helper's high. And like the runner's high, it's short-term and long-term. So you feel good in the short-term and you're transformed as a person long-term when you're of service and helping others and not just thinking about yourself. 
And if we are wired to feel just as good when we help someone as when we work out, I think that's a clue that we were intended to be of love and service uh, to those around us. And I think that, you know, for me, that's my purpose. I, I express it through my work. I express it through my family. I express it through everything really except my driving. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, well, it's, it's, you know, but you aside know, from that, that's it. <laughs> well, I, I love, I love the fact that when you can, you know, sometimes I'll ask a question and people say, I think my purpose is, but you nailed it. And it's so succinct. And one of the things I learned from my own challenges, in my, my life growing up is that, you know, they say to be spiritual, spiritually fulfilled, you know, you, you need to be in service to other people. And yet I could never be in service to others for a third of my life because I didn't wake up in the morning and love myself. And it comes out of you. It comes out of you in, in spades in this interview that, you know, you're a man who believes in himself and loves himself. So you're blessing the world. I want to honor you with a few words. I do this. These are leadership words. Uh, so the first is uh, passion. You are passion, Michael, and you are creativity. The second would be wisdom. You are wisdom. I think about all the people you've met and worked with and <laughs> the knowledge you have. And the third yeah. is you are love. I mean, you're blessing my show and uh, the millions of people that you help to the work you're doing. So I want to thank you for being on the show. Will you come back again in the future? Tom, anytime. It's great pleasure. This is great. Thanks well, for letting me... Uh, open up about things that I don't normally get into. No, I, I appreciate that. And so that's all for today. And everybody, you know, find that true passion and live with purpose, the life that you deserve and desire. Thank you for listening to The Quiet Warrior Show. Create is a motive-based leadership development firm. www.kreat.ca.